Over the next three weeks, we're doing something just a little bit different. We're taking a peek behind the curtain at what makes our church tick by examining the four things that we do to stay on track with our vision. Uh, we're going to talk about, can you guess what it is? The growth track, very good. Okay, someone was paying attention. It was 50 seconds up on the screen there. Okay, uh, that's what we're gonna talk about today and for the next couple of weeks. If you're visiting with us today, or if you're relatively new, I'm so glad that you're here to, uh, to learn uh, about this. You get to know what makes our church tick. What, uh, makes it, what we're passionate about, why we do the things we do, and uh, how we do everything to make sure that you are on track with Jesus. Um, if anyone who knows me even a little bit knows that I have a terrible sense of direction. Uh, I, I get lost going to the front door from my bedroom uh, at home. I, I'm really bad uh, with directions. Uh, I, was, I was remembering this week uh, when I was engaged to my wife Sally some 17, 18 years ago. Um, her family invited me up to spend New Year's with them. They went up the north coast somewhere, I think around Kilcare, and they said, okay, Stephen, you know, you're going to be part of this family. Come up New Year's Eve, have dinner with us, spend New Year's Eve with us, and rack off New Year's Day. You know, that's, that's basically how the relationship with my, well, my father-in-law isn't here today, so I can say that. Um, and so I, I drove uh, up from Penrith to the North Coast, and I got out my trusty UBD, um, you know, something that doesn't exist really anymore. We didn't have GPSs uh, that time, and I tried to trace out a route to where I was supposed to go. And I got in the car, I went up, I went over the Harbour Bridge, uh, took a wrong turn into Chatswood, spent about half an hour doing circles around there, found my way, had a little cry on the side of the road, uh, found my way onto the M1 or whatever it was called then, and I travelled and just kept going and going. I kept looking at the book going, oh, it must be there by now, it must be there by now. I had no idea where I was going. And then suddenly and unexpectedly, I went over the Mooney Mooney Bridge and my UBD ran out. I hit the top of the map and I was a little concerned. I looked at the top and it said I was in Brisbane waters. And I was like, oh, that doesn't sound right. So I called Sally, I pulled over the side of the road and there's just trucks barreling past. And I called Sally and I was in this panic. I'm like, Sally, ah, Sally, I've, I've gone too far. I've gone to Queensland. And I'm like, she's like, what do you mean? You've been driving for an hour and a half. How can you get to Queensland? I'm, like, I'm in Bruce and Ward. She's like, you're an idiot. Now, we, in, in life, we need science to keep us on track. Amen? We need science. We need markers. We need things to say that we're going the right direction. Now, we need science to keep us on track. And for our church, that is what the growth track does. They're like signposts or monuments. I love that we got these two here today. They're like big monuments that point us the way that we need to go, that remind us of the things that we need to do to keep us on track with our vision. They, they point us the right way. And so we are going to look at this idea of the growth track. We did it last year, we're gonna do it again this year, we might do it again next year. You know, it depends on how, uh, my, anyway. But the growth track has these four steps. Uh, it's about helping us know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and, and make a difference. And I want to tackle those first two steps today. Know God and find freedom. Uh, know God and find freedom. They're uh, about creating an environment where people can grow. Creating an environment for us as a church, for our regular attendance, for our visitors, for those who become family, familiar, as it was said, at communion, so that we can all come together and grow. To create the right environment for growth to occur and for that to be healthy. The kind of thing that Sally is doing right now for our family. Yeah, when we, <clears throat> when we press into knowing God and finding freedom, our church is on track so we can create environment for life to thrive and grow and become a Christ-like community. All right, all right, there's one person who's awake, okay. I feel like it's a little dead. Um, and because I didn't get any oohs and ahs, I'll go back to that one. Sally's pregnant, okay. Uh, that was the, that's what that was, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, all right, yeah, uh, no excitement for that. Uh, yeah. No, 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 it's okay, no, no, yeah, yeah, so... I've been mean, trying for four years, don't worry about us, you know, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
Yeah, well, I wouldn't just chuck that in a sermon and just go, oh, so my wife's pregnant. There you go. Yeah, because I've got two, and that's the third one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you guys are a bit more awake than that. Okay. Oh, I'm glad, I, I'm glad we did this. Okay. Because we're going to get into the Word of God, and I need you to be awake for this, because this is important. This is about the heart of our church. This is about how we create an environment to grow, just like Sally is creating an environment for a baby to grow. Do you get the analogy now? Okay, it makes sense. Here we go. We, we want people to know God and find freedom. We want to do things in this place so that people can grow to be Christ-like. Uh, to, and we take our cue from Scripture, from Hebrews chapter 10. If you've got your Bible, open it up. If you've got an app, it's really quick to find it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm the, the hope about Jesus and his life and death and sacrifice and resurrection and how it changes and transforms our lives. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope for God can be trusted to keep his promises. Let us think of ways to motivate each other to acts of love and good works. Let us think about ways that we can encourage one another to stay on track. And let us not neglect our... There we go. And let us not forget our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now the day of Jesus' return is drawing near. You know, let us hold tightly without wavering to our hope. Let us think of ways together to motivate one another, to encourage one another, to be loving and do good works. Let us not give up meeting together. Let's join together in this endeavor. Let's meet together to create a loving community of faith. Uh, a community where we motivate each other to love better, to love more, to serve better, to serve more, to, to care more deeply. You know, we, let's encourage one another. We don't do this alone. Amen? We don't do this alone. We find God, uh, know God and find freedom are uh, two expressions of this passage of Scripture. It's all about, in my mind, meeting big and meeting small, creating the right environments to, to encourage one another, to care for one another, to meet big and to meet small so that we can grow in Christ-likeness. This one is all about meeting big, knowing God, coming together. And this one, find freedom, is about coming to, you know, becoming uh, more intimate, becoming friends and, and loving each other and meeting small. When we start to know, we start with know God. Knowing God is why this church exists, plain and simple. For no other reason do people gather here Sunday after Sunday except for the desire to, for people to know God and for all of us to know God better. Amen? Okay, I'm on track. You know, we, we, we meet here so people can un, uh, encounter the life-giving love of their Creator, to know Him and their purposes for their lives. Helping people to know God comes from our heart and our history as a church. And we put a signpost down, we put a strategy down to make sure we stay on track. To, do, to help people know God, we craft carefully our Sunday services. We try to create a life-giving space, life-giving Sunday services, so that everyone here can know God for the first time or know Him better. That is why we meet together today. Um, another way you might put it is to meet big to meet as a big group of people to say uh, that it is important to, to set aside this time to value one another. You know, what we do on Sundays is important for our faith. It is an opportunity to share our spiritual gifts, to motivate each other to acts of love and service. Now, before the, the service today, I, I eavesdropped accidentally on a conversation and someone said, you know, how are you going today? And they said, I'm not doing terribly well. And that person went and asked and they prayed for them. You know, we get to exercise our gifts when we meet big, we meet people we might never meet during the week. And we get to motivate each other to love and good, and good works, creating meaningful community. You know, to be life-giving, we focus on what is relevant today. We don't, as a church, act on tradition, but on what imparts spiritual and relational growth. That is what we prioritize here. And if we are doing this right, 
if we are prioritizing spiritual and relational growth, so that someone can come in and come to faith and someone can grow in deeper faith in the same Sunday service. Now, to be life-giving, we focus on worship. You know, we, we focus on worship about connecting ourselves with our Creator to create a life-giving environment. We create a welcoming environment, a welcoming atmosphere. And we also speak honestly from the Bible and try to join it with something practical and actionable because these are the things that give life. These are the things that give life. When we still ourselves and open ourselves up in worship to our Creator, when we welcome and greet and love one another, and when we open up God's life-giving Word, we find something that transforms our lives. In 2 Timothy verse 3, 16, it says this, and I love this about Scripture. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is true and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It's a signpost. It helps us to go the right way. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Now, this is what we want to do on Sundays here in this church. We want to open up that scripture that is God-breathed and inspiring and allow it to teach us, to correct us, to point us on the right paths, the paths of life, the paths of blessing. When we meet God, uh, meet big, we're inspired and encouraged to know God and help others do the same. This idea comes from our heart and it comes from our history. So let me just spend a moment there and tell you a little bit about the history of our church. If you're new here today, or if you've been here in the last three, six months, not, you know, well, I could get some people up, like the wonderful uh, people sitting in this row here that could tell us all about the history of the church. So let me just do it really badly for a moment. This church was planted in about 1980. It's actually not that old. And I say that because it's one year younger uh, than me and I'm not old, so it can't be. It was planted in this church, in this community by a guy called Ray Hawkins and a, a team of people from Mayfield Church of Christ. And their goal was to create a place of living hope for the community of Maitland, to minister to this community, to help them to know God and to find freedom in the message of Jesus. And they carried in their hearts when they trudged the, the thousands of kilometres away from Mayfield, or it probably felt like that, uh, you know, 40-something years ago without proper highways. They trudged down and they planted themselves here with a passage of scripture that they carried in their hearts. And it was this, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope, a transformational life, a life that is different, something that is worth imparting in ourselves and imparting into others in this community. He has given us a new birth into a living hope for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And as a church, they came out here and they prayed and they met and they gathered and they planted and they faithfully bought land and built buildings so that you and I today, that they can have a legacy of faith that you and I today could know God and know Him well. That we could meet God and be inspired from His Word and say, okay, this is wonderful. I want to bring someone along with me. I want them to hear about this wonderful hope that I have found. That is uh, the very brief history of our church. That's what has inspired us to be here today. They want to know people to know God and know Him intimately. You know, they, they love this so much that it's in the name of our church, that living hope. But there's also another part of it in our name, and I just want to talk briefly about that as well. We are Living Hope Maitland... Church of Christ, okay, you're still awake, you're still with me, excellent. You know, Church of Christ, I want to just talk about that bit for a moment, uh, about who Churches of Christ are, I'll take 10 seconds, and, and, and what we value. Churches of Christ began in the 1700s uh, as a response to the fragmentation of churches along cultural and denominational lines. You know, you, you go out and you look at uh, the Protestant church and it started as one guy, Luther and Calvin, and all these guys split off and they carried all of this cultural baggage with them. And then they move into a new world like America and Australia and they carry that same cultural baggage. So the people who founded Churches of Christ said, all of that stuff, that, you know, that's so much baggage, so much irrelevant tradition. Why don't we take all of that away? And why don't we just open our Bibles and say, what does God say about who we should be as a people? How we should know Him, how we should celebrate Him. 
And so they said, okay, let's throw off the shackles of a religious ceremony and open our Bibles and return to a primitive Christianity. Just do the things that the Bible says. Love one another. Gather big. Gather small. Uh, uh, go out on mission together. Churches of Christ, then, we, we are not a denomination. We're not, uh, you know, we're not Presbyterians, we're not Baptists, we're not, we don't have this big hierarchical structure. We are simply a group of churches who share some common values, who share a common mission. Uh, and some of those values are, we believe in Christian unity. We believe that this is a church, but it's not the only church. We don't believe that we have all the truth, and if you don't come to our church, that you're not saved. We believe that all churches can carry the name of Jesus. We're, we believe in Christian unity, not putting walls up, but taking them down. We believe in the essentials of faith, about there's certain things we need to believe, but if you believe something different outside of that, you know, we don't have to have a fistfight about it. We don't have to separate and segregate ourselves. We believe in open communion, that anyone who comes through the door can share at the Lord's table and uh, eat the, the, from the, the body and drink the blood of Christ in, in community with us. Uh, we, we value local leadership. We don't have a big denominational structure that so, sits over the top of us. You know, the people who uh, voted and raised up here are the people who lead and the buck stops with us. And the, the, the what, last one that's really important, the big value for us is churches of Christ. Uh, well, two, baptism by immersion for the, uh, the, a mark of discipleship and the primacy of Scripture over tradition. I want to just unpack that just a moment. The primacy, primacy is not a word you hear much, is it, you know, uh, nowadays? You don't go, oh, well, I, I'm prime over my wife or I'm prime over my kids or I really dunked on him and primed him and I, was pri I displayed my primacy at the basketball game. Um, you know, we don't hear that term much, but it has a, a, a lot of weight and gravity to it. We believe in the primacy of Scripture over tradition. That just because we have done something before, it doesn't hold sway or have weight. We're free to, to cast it off to be more like Jesus. Um, get this, um, you know, this is a, a hallmark of Churches of Christ. And some of us have been Churches of Christ for 50, 60, 70 years and we don't, we, sometimes we forget this bit, but it's important. Um, we don't hold, as Churches of Christ, any tradition as important. Tradition can be good, it can be helpful, but when it stops being helpful, we are free to discard it completely. It doesn't matter if we've been doing something for five minutes, five years, or 35 years. It is not sacred. Only Jesus is. Are you with me? Only Jesus is sacred. Then that's who we are as a church. If we want people to know God, we say, okay, how can we be relevant today? We don't want to let the things of the past clutter us up. We want to let it go so that we can be an open and a community for others. That's knowing God. That's meeting big. That's sort of the stuff that we do here. The other part, the next step of the growth track is finding freedom. Knowing God is about meeting big, the corporate experience of church, creating an environment of care and spiritual growth for all of us. Finding freedom is on the opposite side of the scale. It is about creating a more intimate environment to build that familial love, to build community and to grow in faith together. We meet small to support each other meaningfully, to have meaningful relationships with each other. And the signpost, the monolith, the marker on the road to do that, the strategy that we have is to help people find freedom in grace-filled life groups. We want to give life on Sundays and, and fill people with grace during the week. We want to, people to have, uh, feel empowered and open up Scripture and then we want people to uh, be loved on and grown to be more like Jesus, to help people find freedom in grace-filled life groups, intimate, personal, loving, prayerful groups that support you through the ups and downs of life. Who's ever gone through an up? No, okay. Who's ever gone through a down? A lot more of you, okay. We'll pray for you uh, later. You know, we go through ups and downs, so we, we grow small, we meet small to encourage one another to be like Jesus, to be a, create places where we can find freedom. Now, I heard someone at the back that said, freedom from what? 
Very good. Freedom from what? That's a great question. Let's look at that for a moment. Freedom from what? When you look around your, uh, in your, the spheres of influence you have, your friends, your family, your neighbours, when you look sometimes in your own life, you see people who are bogged down. Um, they could be, we talked about this for the last three weeks. People who are bogged in transition. People who are bogged by their circumstances. People who are bogged by the past. Some people who are bogged by sinful actions that have uh, got them unstuck. We look around and we see people stuck and don't know how to move forward in life. They, are, they need freedom. I mean, they could be stuck in debt. Um, they could be stuck because the doctor has given them some bad news and they don't know how to move forward. They could be stuck because they have a bad job and it's really horrible to go there every day and the environment is toxic. Or they might be stuck because they have no job and don't have any hope uh, of, of gaining meaningful employment. Some people are bogged in hate. They are filled with something that rages inside of them and they can't move forward in life. Some people are filled with hurt and they they don't know what to do with it. It just hurts all the time and they, they just uh, get stuck in that and they don't know how to break free. There's people around us that live with lust and, uh, and, and don't know how to uh, find a way out of that. There are people around us and our friends, our family, our neighbours that are caught up in idolatry and they're putting things above God and they're, like, they're struggling with it. They don't know how to break free. Those idols have such a hold and they don't know what to do with it. Being bogged keeps people stuck and away from the, 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 the love of our Saviour Jesus. Being bogged keeps people. I mean, not you and I, obviously. You know, we, we've never had any problems with this, right? You, know, you and I, we're perfect people. You joining us online, you've never had a problem in your life. I know this. But you know, being bogged keeps people. Not you and I. You know, we've never had a problem. Uh, keep, being bogged keeps people from living life to the full. It keeps them slaves to their circumstances. It keeps them reactionary to their problems. Uh, it keeps them unable to plan ahead for the future. When we are bogged, when we are stuck, we don't know how to break free. And as a church, as a pillar of what we do, we want to meet big today and impart something into your life. And we want to meet small and help people break free to find freedom from those things in the past, from those sinful behaviours, uh, from the hurt, from the, uh, the issues on their circumstances that they might walk in freedom and say, I am free indeed because of Jesus. Amen? We want to say, I am free and free indeed. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, that's a limb, what's well, the edge of a stage? Okay, I won't fall down. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that some people in this room, some people joining us online, some people watching this back because they couldn't be here today. Some people in this room have some problems and issues in their lives and they feel stuck. Some of us here are dealing with that bad news from the doctor. Some of us are dealing with hurt and rejection from others. Some of us are, uh, have something happened to us and we've responded with hate and it just wells up inside of us. Some of us are dealing with lust. Some of us have made idols out of things and we don't know how to break free. I want to go out on a limb and say that so many people in this room might be struggling and don't know how to break free that you're just reacting to circumstances, that you're just uh, unable to plan ahead and find a way out. And it is in these moments in life, especially these moments, it is in these moments in life where we need support, that we need people around us, that we need people that we can trust, that we need people who know what's happened in our life and now our history and our story and can get around us and pray for us and help us get unstuck to open up the scriptures and to speak it over our lives, to put their hand on us if it's COVID appropriate and lift us up to God in prayer so that we might find freedom from those circumstances. When we talk about finding freedom, freedom from what uh, we, we want to find, freedom from the past, freedom from our circumstances, freedom from anything that gets us bogged and stopping us becoming the people that God has created 
us to be. And we can't do that in the big group. We can't do that big every Sunday. There's too many people, so we make time to meet small, to uh, join in life groups, and to allow grace to be the thing that is the most present, to allow grace to be the thing that we speak over people's lives. In life groups, a small group of people get together regularly to connect relationally, to grow spiritually, and to serve together. Life groups give us a space to to get to know each other better and develop bonds of care and support that are real, that are strong, that are meaningful, that are based in the love and actions of Jesus. You know, we said, you know, we don't give up meeting together. We come together to work out ways to love one another deeper and to do good works to one another, to strengthen us to be more like Christ. When you're going through a tough time in life, when you're struggling with big questions, do you want to go through those times alone? No. Thank you, brother. No, that's the passion right there. When we are going through a tough time, when we are struggling, we don't want to do it alone. We want others around us. And the best time to get others around us is before we have the problem, to love and support and to develop bonds of care. So we encourage you in this church to find freedom, to get into grace-filled life groups so that when you go through the downs, you can be supported, held up in the grace of God. You know, we don't want you to stumble through and, and try and find your way in, in the midst, in the darkness. We want you to be carrying the light for each other, to grow more like Jesus. You know, in Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5, it says this. Now, it has a different context, but I believe this is right for us today when we're talking about finding freedom. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church and said, Just as our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function. Say, I'm special. You have a special function, church. Just like our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function, so do you. So it is with Christ's bodies. Those who call upon the name of the Lord and are saved, those who experience His grace and love and mercy, those who, who have put their sin in the grave with Him and been raised to, with living hope and new life because of that resurrection, so it is with Christ's bodies. We are many parts but part of one body and we belong to each other. We belong to each other. We uh, belong to each other, to care for each other, to love each other, to support each other, so, and find freedom together. That doesn't happen accidentally. A body doesn't, you know, the, the baby uh, growing in Sally didn't happen accidentally. It takes intention. Uh, don't think about that too much. When we grow as a church, it takes intention to realize who we are, and to intentionally put time aside to love and grow with others. And when we do that, when we meet big, when we meet small, we create a community of love and support and that gives life and gives grace and changes people's lives. There's a guy called Larry Crabb. Um, he said this about life groups. He says, in life groups, people have the opportunity to journey toward God. Togetherness in Christ encourages movement towards Christ. The Holy Spirit has placed resources in every Christian that when released from one person and received into another can promote substantial healing and change. That's the power of life groups. That uh, when we, uh, the Spirit of God is in us, when it's released from one person to another. When we take that, what God has imparted into us, that love, that mercy, that forgiveness, that sense of justice, uh, his patience, his kindness, his gentleness, as fruits of the Spirit, when we take what God has implanted and imparted into us and release it to another, it can promote substantial healing and change. It can get you unstuck and growing to be more like Jesus. This is the kind of church that I want to lead, the kind of church that I want to be family in, the kind of church that I want to be a part of, the kind that receives the Spirit of God, that comes together to know God, that meets together for mutual encouragement, to open up the Word together and to let it speak to our hearts, and then meets in small groups, in life groups together, and allows that wonderful goodness of God to flow from us into the lives of others, to see 
them change and when we need it to allow it to come the other way. Here is my hope for you, church, to meet big, to meet small, for life-giving and grace-receiving. To meet big, to meet small, to know God and find freedom for life-giving and grace-receiving. That is the model that our early church gives us. When we talk about being a church of Christ and then throwing off tradition and just looking at the Bible about how we should be, that is what we see. People meeting together to love God, love each other, to know Him and to help people be released into freedom. It's what it says in Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 34 to 37. It says this, and I love it. It says, all the believers, how many? All, all the believers, you know, that includes you and I. I It's talking about a particular moment in history and time, but this is reflected for us today. And it gets a bit more difficult the more we read. So strap yourselves in. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They opened up the word of God and received and allowed them to change their lives. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to community, to meeting together, to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper. They devoted themselves to one another and to prayer. Prayer. And in that moment, something changed, something happened when they took this seriously, when they took the idea of knowing God seriously, when they took the idea of finding freedom seriously, when they took the idea of community and loving each other seriously, something happened to them. It says a deep sense of awe came over them. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And then all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. They were full of love, life and grace for one another. Here's where it gets difficult, okay. You know, this is not circumstantial for every circumstance, but it is good to remind ourselves of how deep the bonds of love grow when we allow ourselves to know God and to find freedom. It says they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. It made an impact on who they are. And that impact changed the lives of others. So they worshipped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day, here's the consequence. When we, when we get on track, when we're finding our place in the community of God, when we're finding a place in community of others, uh, this is what happens. When we love each other, when we share and give of ourselves, it says, and each day for them and each day for us, God added to their fellowship those who are being saved. It makes a difference. And I want to be on track with that. It makes a difference. I want to be on track to be a, 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 not just a group of people who meet to sing when we can and listen to this guy waffle on and, and stumble on this particular day, but that's okay. I'm better every other day. Uh, we don't come here just to have a wonderful cup of coffee uh, in the foyer. We come here to allow our lives, our minds, our souls to be orientated to the intentions of God and allow that to bring change to our lives and the lives of others to so that others might be saved when we intentionally meet big and small we motivate one another with godliness with love and with good works with the blessed effect of growing god's kingdom so what do we do with all of this what are our next steps today what are the, the things that we can do from here to make sure that we stay on track i've got four i'll go through quickly because you know people might be nodding off it's okay here's the first one we need to know God, and that means creating community with one another. Who wants, to, who wants a friend? Put your hand up, go on. Look around, all right, there's some honest people. You want a friend? Like, go, go find that person after church with a hand up and go say hello. We need to create community in this place to be open to one another. Uh, my encouragement to all of us is if possible, don't dine and dash. Um, you know what I mean by that, church? Yeah, or, or, I've got to know. Dine and Dash is that thing you did once uh, you told me about. No. Um, Dine and Dash is when you go to a restaurant and you order all the best stuff and all the best wine and all the best food and then uh, the bill comes and then you say, oh, I'm going to the toilet and you run out the door. That's dining and dashing. That's that thing you confess to me. You know, I'm a safe person to confess to. No. 
I love you, my sister. You know, I know you wouldn't do that. You know, we don't want to die in that. We don't want to receive the good stuff and then run away and not create community here. I know some people have to go. I know some people, there's pressing needs in life, but my encouragement to you is we grow in community when we make time to be in community. Are you with me? Don't dine and dash. Help create community in this place. If you're new, someone will come and say hello to you. Uh, If you're not new, go and say hello to someone. Go and say hello to someone you don't know and just say, what's God been doing in your life? Or that's a nice ring you've got there. Or, oh, where'd you buy those shoes? Or how can I help you today? My shoes are nice. Um, Don't dine and dash. Help create community. And the next one is we we need to know God. And uh, sometimes in churches, uh, we can stagnate a little. We can do the same things over and over. We can create traditions. And in those traditions, we go, oh, well, uh, sometimes those traditions grow stagnant. Those traditions don't help us anymore. We do things in a service, we do things during the week, and we say, oh, well, I have to do that because that's what we've always done. But the heart of churches of Christ says, no, 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 no. When things about you live their usefulness, we discard them. We honour God for the fact that we could have that in the past, but now we put that aside and we move forward. So if you see things in our life of our church that are growing stagnant, come and talk to me. Come and talk to the elders. Come and do something about it. Say, okay, maybe it's time to reinvigorate that and I want to be a part of that. Or you say, oh, well, that thing we do just doesn't, doesn't benefit anyone and we can pray about that and see if God wants us to do something new. Next one, find freedom. This is, not, this is a no-brainer. I'm, I'm not imparting rocket surgery on you and, and today. You know, find freedom. Get in a life group. Um, there, there is probably half the people in this room that are in a life group. My encouragement to you is just say, hey, I want to surround myself with a small group of people that I can love and be loved by because that's what you're committing to. I want to be uh, with a group of people who know me and can help me and that I know and that I can help when things aren't going right. I want to be involved with a group of people that we can open the Bible and speak honestly to one another about our struggles and to stop being bogged and to, get, and to overcome. And the last one is this. If you are so inclined in your heart and feel God leading to you, uh, speaking to you this, say, I want to lead a group. Uh, we don't have enough group leaders. Yeah, uh, I, I want everyone in our church to be in a life group. I was in a, uh, my very first ministry role. I was at Penrith Church of Christ. And the first time I was paid for ministry is to be the pastor of the life groups. And we got to 97% of the church in life groups. I want, you know, I want to be there in this church. I want everyone to say that finding freedom in my life and helping others find freedom is important. It's a priority. And we need group leaders. We need godly people, men and women, to lead these groups. So if God puts that on your heart, come and talk to me. Come and talk to Dawn. I'll point her out later. And we will create, a, try and find a space for you to lead. And lastly, let's just stay on track. Let's do those things in our life that keep us on track. Yeah, the, the growth track uh, the growth track isn't just the message that I preach every year. It's a way of living and being as a church to faithfully represent Jesus to ourselves, to this community and to the community out there. And I want to invite you to commit to it today. I want to invite you, and I'll do this every week for the next three weeks as we look at the other steps of the growth track. I want to invite you to commit to this because this is who we are as a church. This is who we want to be as a church. This is the things that we do. And if you can't commit to that, we want to help you find another church where it has an ethos that you can commit to. I want to ask you to and invite you to commit to these ideas. I mean, you're, you're, you're here today and you're here online, so you've already committed to the first part. You're already meeting big, that's good. But uh, even the meeting small bit, to commit to meeting big and, and motivating one another and showing love to one another and meeting small to make a difference in one another's lives. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up. I'm not going to ask you to come out to the front. I might do that in a couple of weeks' time. But I want to put that in your heart and soul today. If this is who we are as a church, will you say, yes, I'm in. Yes, I want to be a part of that. Yes, I understand that. Yes, I want to be that. I want that to be who I am. And I want to show that to the world. 
And if it's not here you are, let's bless you and find you some place that you can be. Okay, I'm going to ask the band to come up. I'm going to pray while that happens. Then we're going to have some wonderful coffee, morning, uh, not morning tea, just coffee, tea and stuff out the front. Don't uh, hang around. Don't be a stranger. Don't dine and dash. All right. Holy Father, I want to thank you so very much that uh, you give us signposts in life of where we can go and where we should be. And Lord, as a church, we talk about meeting big and meeting small today, about helping people to know you and then helping people to find freedom in you. And Father, I pray that uh, anything in this church that we do that doesn't meet those objectives, that uh, run contrary to that, that you would cut and prune out for us today. But Father, I pray right now that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, speak to our souls. Lord, as we are temples of the Holy Spirit containing part of you in us today, that you would speak, your Holy Spirit that is inside us will speak to our souls and bring us closer to you to make us passionate, Lord, about loving one another, to make us passionate about finding ways to do even better good deeds uh, to one another. And Lord, to make us open to one another, to uh, help unstick each other from the past, the bonds of sin, and to find freedom in you. Lord Jesus, I give all of this to you today. In your holy name I pray. Amen.